Today's sermon has actually been inspired by three different sources. The first one is the Godly Play curriculum, which you will hear me talk about liberally in our sermon today. The second one is the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke was probably written around the late second century, early third century, and is actually part of two books that were written by the same author, Luke and Acts. And Luke Acts takes up almost a third of the Christian Bible, a lot of space. And it sets the basic structure of today's church liturgical calendar. Tradition tells us that Luke was a physician, an educated person, and the companion of Paul, Paul being the apostle who was the apostle. That was, a, uh, that was like a Freudian slip, apostle, apostle, impossible. Makes me wonder about what his personality was like. Anyway, Paul was the apostle who was arguably the most uh, uh, concerned about evangelizing the Gentiles. And his letters comprise another third of the Christian text. So together, it takes up two thirds of the New Testament. The author who wrote Luke wrote hoping, wrote hoping to show the world that Jesus was not only the fulfillment of God's promises to the people of Israel, but also God's promises to the entire world. It starts off with a very long introduction showing the birth stories of both John the Baptist and Jesus. And then the middle section is we see Jesus' mission in Galilee, and the closing section is Jesus and his disciples and their long journey to Jerusalem, which ends in Jesus' death and resurrection. The point of Luke, or one of the, the main points of Luke, is that only when we accept Jesus' upside-down kingdom, where the poor and the outcasts are valued, will we really be able to see and know Christ? When we accept that God's joy welcomes everyone, everyone with no exceptions, into the family, the great family, and all it takes is humility and repentance from ways that hurt us, we will then have an open heart experience and participate in the kingdom of God. The second reading is a contemporary reading by Alla Renee Bozart, who was one of the Philadelphia Eleven. You may not have heard of the Philadelphia Eleven, but back in 1974, they were the first women to be ordained in the Episcopal Church, and it wasn't even officially uh, allowed. They made a lot of waves to, be, to, say, uh, to say it simply. And also... Our claim to fame is that our own Mary Sue Evers was her, uh, Alla was her spiritual director. There we go. So she knew a little bit about Alla and her copious poems, which included phrases like stars in your bones and ocean in your blood. I love this poem that we're going to hear today because it connects a 2,000-year-old story to modern times and helps me feel a part of it part of the mystery of God, as I hope it does for you too. And so our reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Try, try to listen to this like you haven't heard it before, although I'm guessing most of you have. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. 
In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy to all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom God favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. And now this poem, I was just delighted to see a poem by Alla Bozart in the bulletin. I said, JJ, do you know her? Alla was my, my uh, spiritual director for like 12 years and every month I would make a pilgrimage to her little retreat house her home up outside of Sandy, and she remains an important person to me to this day. Before Jesus was his mother. Before supper in the upper room, breakfast in the barn. Before the Passover feast, a feeding trough. And here the altar of earth, fair linens of hay and seed. Before his cry, her cry. Before his sweat of blood, her bleeding and tears. Before his offering, hers. Before the breaking of bread and death, the breaking of her body in birth. Before the offering of the cup, the offering of her breast. Before his blood, her blood. And by her body and blood alone, his body and blood and whole human being. The wise ones knelt to hear the woman's word in wonder. Holding up her sacred child, her God in the form of a babe, she said, Receive, and let your hearts be healed, and your lives be lived with love. This is my body. This is my blood. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for our lives and thank you for our breath. Thank you for the retelling of a story that we, many of us, have heard over and over again. Breathe in it new life for us so that we may see you in the words and experience what it is that you would have us experience so that we can know you better. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So a few weeks ago, um, a couple of friends of mine approached me. Uh, these are friends who uh, are not Christians. They, one of them is Jewish and the other one goes to a New Thought Church. But what we all have in common is that we participate in Red Road or Native American spirituality together. And my two friends approached me and they said very seriously, so what exactly is Advent? <laughs> they were very confused. So we had a little Zoom meeting and we had a little Sunday school lesson about what is Advent. And I learned some things too. Uh, I started off with liturgical, the, the, uh, the liturgical year. The liturgical year, the calendar of the church is basically divvied up into three different sections. There's a large chunk that's ordinary time there's Lent Easter, and then there's Advent Christmas. 
And there's some extra days in there too. There's Epiphany and Pentecost, and if you're Catholic or Orthodox, there's lots of feast days also. But generally, there's these three different chunks of time. And now all of it works together to help tell the story of Jesus the Christ. And they probably started using this rhythm of the year um, probably, definitely by the 500s, maybe as early as the late 300s. So it's been quite a while since we've been using this calendar. The calendar of the church year makes a circle. So you can pick any point in the story to start from, but it makes sense to say that the church year starts in Advent just because it marks the time leading up to Jesus' birth, which is as good a place to start as any. It's also the time of year where our secular calendar ends and another year starts. I'm sure that's not a coincidence. Now, as many of you know, the children's curriculum here at Cedar Hills United Church of Christ is called Godly Play. It's based on a Montessori way of looking at school. We use open-ended questions, and it's a storytelling-based approach. The teachers memorize stories, and the children sit in a semicircle, and we use a little, we use people of God and other manipulatives to tell the story. We've had uh, older people tell stories. We've had middle-aged people tell stories, men and women and, and teens and all sorts of people tell stories. Everyone can do this. And I think that if you talk to most teachers, they will also agree with me that it can end up feeling like a spiritual practice to memorize those stories and to tell them in such a way that creates reverence and respect and happiness and joy and anticipation in a group of elementary school age children. And I'm happy to say that this year, we're using as a whole congregation the basic godly play Advent rhythm for our whole congregation. So that's kind of exciting. And what I mean by that is that we are, when we light the Advent candles, we are using the, the metaphors for the prophets, the holy family, and next week we'll, we'll talk about the shepherds and the magi, and then of course at the end uh, we talk about the Christ candle in the middle. Each Advent story in the godly play starts off something like this. A long time ago, the church realized that people need time to enter into a great mystery like Christmas. So it set aside four weeks. Because if we don't prepare, we could walk right by a mystery like Christmas and not even know it. This time of year, you will see people hurrying in the malls, buying things and doing this and that, but they will miss the mystery. They don't know how to get ready, or maybe they forgot. So Advent is the time of getting ready for the great mystery. Godly play speaks to a journey to Bethlehem where the children are invited, and now we are as well, to go with the prophets, the holy family, the shepherds, and the wise ones on the long road to Bethlehem to a stable where the king, who is like no other king because he has no riches and no armies, no earthly power, the king is waiting. And it's a story that was back then and is also right now. Last Sunday, you heard the Norton Ingram family light our first candle and introduce the prophets. The prophets pointed the way to Bethlehem. They didn't know exactly what was going to happen there, but they knew that this was the place. So they pointed the way. Another thing about prophets to know is that they can be anybody. They pay attention. They know things. Because prophets come so close to God, and God comes so close to, the, to them, that they know what is, is important, and they know what God wants. Last week, we heard Pat Ross preach on the Annunciation and invited each of us to have our own experience. The case can be made that Mary is Christianity's greatest prophet because she came so close to God, and God came so close to her, that she knew what was important, and she knew what God wanted. This Sunday, you saw the Harper family light two candles, 
and we celebrate the prophets again and the Holy Family. The brilliance of godly play really is that it can expand with the children because each, most of the stories, we end with four basic questions. Not always, but mostly, we end up with four basic questions. What is your favorite part of the story? Where are you in the story or what part is about you? What part is most important? And what part could you let go, leave out and we could still have all the story we need? These questions are designed so that as the child grows, the answers to these questions can change and expand and deepen. A four-year-old who believes unequivocally that fairies exist is going to respond in a diff much different way to these stories than a 10-year-old who has just discovered the brilliance of science. And that expansion and deepening doesn't end. Hopefully it continues on into teens, into the teens and adult years. And hopefully what we have taught these children is that a spiritual practice requires questions like these, these open-ended questions where we can change and grow and doubt and wrestle. Questions are not only allowed, but they're vital for a, revo excuse me, a robust spiritual life. So keeping this in mind, when we look at the Holy Family this Sunday, there are so many different interpretations of this story. We have the players, Mary, Joseph, and a donkey, and they're on their way to Bethlehem. Mary is about to have a baby, so she walks really slow, and sometimes she gets really tired, and she has to ride on the donkey because it's really hard to walk a long way when you're about to have a baby. But after a while, when you're about to have a baby, riding a donkey is also very difficult. So you have to, she got off and she walked. She rode and she walked and she rode and she walked. And probably they were the last ones to get to Bethlehem that night. So if you have these three characters, maybe the magic of that story is what appeals to you the most. The angels and the magi with their secret astro astrology books and all of the magic that goes along with that story. Maybe that is what helps you get into the story and to see God. Maybe it's the promise of a powerful, almighty God being born into the world that can avenge all of the people who have done well in their lives and tried to be good and make everything right. Maybe when you look at this story, it's important, for, it's important to you to hear each individual word and to know it as a literal account, word by word. Maybe that is what gives you hope and gives you a framework on which to place your spirituality. Maybe when you hear this story, you're skeptical and you need proof. Maybe archaeological digs and literary devices bring you closer to the story than thinking of it as a literal truth. Or maybe you hear this story and what you hear are metaphors. You see metaphors for God's love and compassion and understanding. And you know that although this family represents different energies in each human being, that not all families need to look like this to be holy. Maybe you see all of these different kinds of interpretations and you hold them all because we, you know that each one of these interpretations brings something important, a, t a bit of information that will lead you to know Christ more intimately. Or maybe you see this story and you can feel it inside of yourself as well as outside of yourself and you can hold all of these things together. Maybe you're somebody who changes your mind every day Today I need to believe in the magic of the magi, and tomorrow I need to believe in the literary devices and the metaphors are what gives me hope and faith in this story. Maybe none of it works for you, and maybe all of it works for you. But the important thing is, is that we keep telling the story. There's a reason why we keep telling it over and over and over, because there, it's important and it's in some ways, whichever way you look at it, it's true. These stories are sacred and they lead us to have a heart opening experience, to know the birth of Christ from within 
or from without. Next Sunday, we'll light the candle dedicated to the shepherds and hear about them and their journey. And the fourth candle after that is for the wise ones who are always a little bit late because they have a long way to go. And, and then on Christmas, we'll get ready to light the center candle. And maybe by this time, after all of this preparation and all this journey towards Bethlehem, we'll be ready to enter the mystery of the birth of Christ. In the Gospel of Luke, we hear a lot about the journey to Jerusalem, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and rightfully it focuses on that. But first, before we go to Jerusalem, we have to go to Bethlehem. We have to experience that birth. Going to Bethlehem prepares us for the journey to Jerusalem, where the whole thing, Bethlehem is where the whole thing starts. And we are all, no matter where we are or what we believe or what kind of faith that we can hold, we are all invited to take that journey together. Amen.